رسول الله حبيب الله رسول الله حبيب الله الله our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he wanted humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he wanted humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim all praise due to Allah alone we praise him and we seek his help Whomsoever Allah guides is a truly guided one, and whomsoever Allah leaves astray, none can show him guidance. May the best peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. My dear viewers, welcome to another live edition of our program, Gardens of the Pious, and today's episode, where the grace of Allah is number 407, in the blessed series of Riyadhul Salihin by Imam Nawawi. May Allah have mercy on him. Chapter number 174. And basically, that is the second episode and the second hadith in studying this chapter. Chapter 174 deals with ما يقول إذا نزل منزلا. What kind of supplication to be recited when you encamp somewhere, or um, when you camp at a place where you fear any harm that may befall you? The only hadith in this chapter that we're studying today is hadith number 983. The hadith is collected by Imam Abu Dawood in his Sunan and it is narrated by Abdullah ibn Amr. Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him and his father. An ibn Umar radiyallahu anhumah qal kana rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam idha safar faaqbal al-laylu qala يا أرض ربي وربك الله أعوذ بالله من شرك وشر ما فيك وشر ما خلق فيك وشر ما يدب عليك وأعوذ بك وأعوذ بك من شر أسد وأسود ومن الحية والعقرب ومن ساكن البلد ومن والد وما ولد سو عبد الله ابن عمر بن الخطاب من الله بيبليز ودهم عن his father narrated that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, whenever he would set out on a journey, he would say by the nightfall upon encamping somewhere, address him the place, the valley, the land on which he's going to camp or spend the night. O land, my Lord and your Lord is Allah. I seek refuge in him from your evils. The evil of what you contain the evil of what has been created in you and the evil of what walks upon you. And I see refuge in Allah from lions, black serpents, scorpions, and from the inhabitants of that place and from the parent referring to the origin of uh, Satan, Satan himself, and his offspring who inhabit the settlement, his helpers and his hosts of the devils. Before we tackle this hadith, I have a couple of things I need to bring to your attention. The first is this hadith is a weak hadith. It's not a sound hadith. So, well, if it is a weak hadith, why are we studying it? Because this hadith prescribes a supplication. It doesn't prescribe a legislation. It doesn't deal with do's and do not do's, al-halal and haram. We're not going to establish a ruling or legislation. Basically, it's a virtuous saying, something to be recited whenever you're traveling, whenever you came somewhere, seeking protection on Allah, and all the statements of the hadith are perfect. It is true that the Almighty Allah taught us to say, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ in Surah Al-Falaq, say, I seek refuge in the Lord of the dawn. مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقَ From the evil of what He has created. And you know what? After Jumu'ah, day before yesterday, a couple of days ago, a young man approached me and he said, I just have a question for you. Why did God create evil? If it is evil, why did he create evil? 
So the answer is laid down clearly, is laid down clearly in Surah Al-Zumar and in the beginning of Surah Al-Mulk when Allah the Almighty says He is the Almighty, the all forgiven He is the one who created death and life in order to test you which one of you is best indeed. So in order for the test, for the trial to take place, the person has to see both. There's got to be good and evil. And when he allows the evil to take place, it doesn't mean that he approves it or he likes it. He only allows it to happen because that's a test. We as human beings and the jinn kind were created and were given this free choice. So there must be wrong and there must be what is right. And we've been guided to what is right and warned against what is wrong. So when you choose what is wrong, it's your liability, you're liable. In Surah Al-Zumar, Allah the Almighty says that Allah is not pleased with those who disbelieve. وَإِن تَكْفُرُوا لَا يَرْضَهُ لَكُمْ He does not accept and he is not pleased with those who disbelieve. So why does he allow people to disbelieve? He allowed only human beings and the jinn kind to choose whether to believe or to disbelieve. Unlike the angels, لَا يَعْصُونَ اللَّهَ مَا أَمَرَهُمْ وَيَفْعَلُونَ مَا يُؤْمَرُونَ So whatever is required for the test to take place, of diseases, of death, of suffering, of adversities, of hardship is also created by Allah. Allah khaliqu kulli shay wa huwa ala kulli shay in wakil. He is the creator of everything including the evil. When he does allow the evil to take place doesn't mean at all he is pleased with it or he is happy with it. But he allows you in order for the test to be valid to be meaningful. So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would travel and at night on his journey, there are a lot of dangers. Those people who travel on the back of their camels. So among that danger, insects, poisonous insects, snakes, scorpions, wild animals, reptiles, jinn kind, so the Prophet وسلم, used to seek refuge with Allah against all of that by saying, O oh land, O oh valley, O oh this place, my Lord and your Lord is Allah. And if this is the case, somebody would say, but don't you think that Al-Ard, the mountains, the trees are, you guys call them uh, lifeless objects, inanimates? Yeah, we call them so. But as Muslims, we also believe that Subhanallah, the Almighty Allah said in Surah Al-Isra, وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِهُ وَلَكِن لَا تَفْقَهُونَ تَسْبِحَهُمْ So according to this ayah and many other ayahs, Allah the Almighty stated that there is not a single creature, but it glorifies the praise of Allah. It declares that Allah is free from any imperfection. They do thank Allah. They do say Subhanallah. They magnify Allah. The only issue is that you do not comprehend the way they glorify the Lord. So they claim that the desk that you're sitting on right now is glorifying Allah. Yes, I do. And this is what Allah stated in this ayah. وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِهِ The word shay is anonymous, which means and there is not a single thing that he created, life or, fly, or lifeless, human beings, jinn, animals, angels, uh, the heavens, the earth, إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِهِ But they glorify the praise of Allah the Almighty. Yet you don't comprehend how they do so. So it is perfectly fine and it is in line with the ayah and with the other ayat which indicate that all living creatures and non-living creatures, all creatures do praise and glorify Allah the Almighty. And they worship Him. So when you address the earth, the land, 
and the place whom you're going through and you're traveling saying, Ya Ard, Rabbi wa Rabbuki Allah. My Lord and your Lord is Allah. Then what? So I seek refuge in your Creator and in my Creator, in our Lord, both of us. Min sharriki wa sharri ma fiki wa sharri ma khuliqa fiki. I seek refuge in Allah against your evil, if there is any evil in you. The evil that walks on you, the evil that is hidden within you, that is contained within you. Wa sharri ma yadibbu alayki. The right pronunciation is yadibbu. And I seek refuge with Allah again is the evil of everything that walks, crawls, or moves on top of you. So, min sharri ma khuliqa fiki, there are a lot of creatures that are very harmful. Snakes, scorpions, black widows, wild animals, you know, they would not think twice before devouring a human being. But when you seek the refuge in Allah Almighty against those creatures, you are provided with this refuge. You are protected divinely by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ Now بِكَ because you're talking to Allah. And this is called iltifat, like shifting. In the beginning of this statement, you are addressing the earth, O oh land, O oh earth. And now وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ All of a sudden you change to seek refuge in Allah as you're talking to him the second. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you. Again, is the evil of Asadin wa Aswadin. What is the Asad and what is the Aswad? Al-Asad in Arabic is a lion. So the lion or the wild animals. And Al-Aswad is a specific kind of serpents, scorpions, the exceedingly black as among the spiders, there is the black widow, which is most poisonous. So among the snakes, among the scorpions, the one which is the black serpents. So I seek refuge with Allah, most specifically against these creatures. And I seek refuge in Allah, generally speaking, against all scorpions and snakes. And from the inhabitants of this place and... Min sakin al balad. What is sakin al balad? We have learned when we studied in the course of aqidah about the jinn, they live in the desert, the abandoned places, and uh, they like to stay away from people. And before Islam, people also recognize that, so they used to. When they encamp somewhere, they used to seek refuge, not in Allah against the jinn who are living there, but in the master of the jinn in that place. So they used to say, A'udhu bi Sayyidi hadha al-wadi. I seek refuge in the master of this valley, of the jinn. And that is stated in the Quran. And you know who informed us about it? Allah recounted what the jinn who accepted Islam upon hearing the Quran recited by Prophet Muhammad, they said, وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ رِجَالٌ مِّنَ الْإِنسِ يَعُوذُونَ بِرِجَالٍ مِّنَ الْجِنِّ فَزَادُوهُمْ رَهَقًا There used to be some people of the human beings Whenever they travel and they encamp somewhere, they, see, they used to seek refuge in the jinn. Again, is the harm of the other jinn. أعوذ بسيدي هذا الواد. فزادوهم رهقا. That gave a big boost to the jinn. They said, look, human beings fear us. And they seek refuge in us because they fear us. They revere and they respect us. While the fact of the matter that the one whom we should seek refuge in Again, is the jinn, and again, is everything is only the creator of us and the jinn, Allah. So I seek refuge again, is sakin al balad, the inhabitants of this place or this settlement of the jinn, obviously. And I seek refuge again, is Satan, who is the parent or the father of all Satans and his offspring of the rebellious jinn.
That is the meaning of this hadith. And if one doesn't know the hadith, doesn't memorize the hadith, it will be perfectly sufficient to say, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقِ وَمِنْ شَرِّ الرَّاسِقٍ إِذَا وَقَبْ وَمِنْ شَرِّ النَّفَّاثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدِ وَمِنْ شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حَسَدْ As a matter of fact, after the Almighty Allah revealed the last two chapters of the Quran, 113, 114, which are known as Al-Mu'awwidhatayni, the two means of seeking protection in Allah again is the harm of whatever. The Prophet ﷺ started awfully utilizing them as means of ruqya, ta'weed, seeking protection in Allah because they're very sufficient, they're very comprehensive. These supplications will be perfectly fine if you memorize them or if you read them from a written material whenever you go somewhere or land or decide to spend the night somewhere or you're traveling at night somewhere. A couple days ago, I decided myself and family to go somewhere camping where at night it was really scary. You know, if you were to know beforehand this is what you're going to experience, you would choose not to. It's hard to close your eyes or to go to sleep when you see the, the entire place covered with darkness. But once you say these supplications, that's it. You're divinely protected. No insects, no poisonous insects, no wild animals, nothing would harm you as long as you sought protection in Allah the Almighty. The second chapter, and it is chapter 175. I love this chapter, brothers and sisters, and I want you to pay close attention to it. The recommendation of returning home soon after the accomplishment of a task upon traveling or undertaking a journey. The hadith is hadith number 984. Hadith number 984. It's a very interesting hadith. It's a sound hadith agreed upon its authenticity. It is the only hadith in this chapter. In this hadith, عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال السفر قطعة من العذاب يمنع أحدكم طعامه وشرابه ونومه فإذا قضى أحدكم نهمته من سفره فليعجل إلى أهله اتفق عليه the great companion Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, Traveling is a piece of torment, since it deprives a traveler of his food, drink, and sleep. So when one of you has accomplished his purpose of journey, let him return home as soon as possible, as quickly as he can. The hadith is collected by the two great Imams, Bukhari and Muslim, may Allah have mercy on them. Is it really true that traveling is a torment or semi-torment or some sort of torment? Well, brothers and sisters, when we talk about traveling nowadays, there is no comparison between traveling just 100 years ago or even 50 years ago let alone 1,400 years ago. You know, those who just returned from Hajj, they say that the journey from Medina to Mecca was troublesome. Why? We spent on the bus 12 hours. Really? It's about 500 kilometers or 400 miles. And normally, if you're driving yourself, it will take between three and a half to four hours. Four hours maximum. But because of a lot of checkpoints and a lot of uh, paperwork, the pilgrims got stuck in the buses, in the caravans, and the heavy traffic, you know, for uh, that much time, 12 hours. And people complain and they say, we suffered a great deal. What about if you ask yourself, how long did it take Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to migrate? Or for the travelers to travel from Medina to Mecca or vice versa, like during Umrah or Hajj, how many days? Days. 
the least three days if you're constantly covering distance you know it can take up to one week why because you're riding on back of your camel or horse or donkey or even walking and how much food you need to carry with you bear on your back or place it on the back of your ride and walk next to it and how much water you need to take sufficient for days and the risk of being attacked by highway robbers or the jinn or the um, you know the insects the poisonous snakes and scorpions any of that a lot of risk a lot of hazards that's why when the prophet says السفر قطعة من العذاب that is true when you when you consider what happened in the past those who book first class uh, fare or business class flight and they turn their seats into beds or they travel in a private jet obviously they enjoy the journey but what if an accident happened like the ash cloud or there is a hurricane and they suspend all flights and people get stuck they get stuck for days rich and poor they get stuck at the airport they sleep on the floor why because you don't have any vacancy I'm willing to pay you know a thousand dollar per night for the room which is worth fifty dollar we don't have rooms empty even if you're pay- willing to pay ten thousand so you get stuck and you just sleep on the floor like everybody else you suffer a little bit but even though this is not really much of suffering compared to the danger and the risk that people use to experience in the past add to that that the fear of vanishing the food and the drink in case you get lost because those people used to follow the stars as their GPS what in case that they get lost they will simply eat and drink whatever they have of food until it vanishes then they die out of starvation as simple as that so there is a big danger correct maybe you will be attacked by highway robbers who would not just take whatever they have they would just lane them for the sake of (laughs) practicing their work you know big danger the Prophet said in another hadith collected by Imam Tabarani why a safar or journeying is considered you know some sort of troublesome or torment he said because يَمْنَعُ الْمُؤْمِنَ صَلَاتَهُ وَصِيَامَهُ a believer who's used to pray and fast now he's traveling so he doesn't get to pray as much he doesn't get to fast because he's traveling and the Prophet said لَيْسَ مِنْ إِمْبَرِّنِمْ صِيَامٍ فِي الْصَفَرْ if you're traveling you should break your fast and Allah the Almighty prescribed shortening the prayers for a traveler because it is troublesome and he prescribed combining the prayers as well for a traveler all of that just to make it easy for the traveler because it is troublesome it is hardship and difficulty correct after all the Prophet ﷺ said so when you travel once you finish and accomplish your deal your business your trade your mission فَإِذَا قَضَى أَحَدُكُمْ نَهْمَتَهُ مِنْ سَفَرِهِ فَلْيُحَجِّلْ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ hurry to return home as soon as possible because that you know suffering wasn't only for you as a traveler your wife your kids they're missing you so much maybe more than you're missing them and in an interesting incident Umar al-Khattab radiyallahu an had to ask Hafsa his daughter the Prophet's wife how long would a woman bear patiently the absence of her husband so she said between three to four months maximum because she too has needs so Umar al-Khattab may Allah be pleased with him immediately issued a verdict to all the commanders of the Muslim armies that any expedition any Muslim soldier should not spend traveling on a camp or military post or out of town more than four months maximum and he allowed months one month traveling and one month returning so the maximum period of time will be six months why because it isn't only about the traveler it's about his wife how much he's missing him his kids how much they are in need for him and how much he's missing them too so that's why the Prophet ﷺ said 
Once you accomplish your need, return home as soon as possible. And this is a sound hadith, brothers and sisters. Inshallah, I'll take a short break. Then soon after the break, we'll begin a new chapter and open the phone line for your questions and concern. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. I'd like to remind you with our phone numbers in this segment I will be more than happy to take some of your calls and concerns. Inshallah, priority obviously is pertaining to the subject. Um, area code 002, then 02. 3855-131, the other number is same area code, then 01005469323. The WhatsApp number is area code North America uh, 001-347-806025. And also we'll take uh, your questions from the page as well, inshallah. All right. Um, let me begin by Saif saying, how many rak'ah should we offer if we combine Dhuhr and Asr Salah at the time of Qasr? Obviously, if you're praying, uh, shortening the prayer, enjoying that concession, if you're traveling the travel distance, then all the four rak'ah prayers will be shortened to only two. And the Qasr or shortening only takes place to Dhuhr, Asr, and Isha. Uh, there is no Qasr in Fajr, there is no Qasr in Maghrib, as well. Besides that, the person will be exempt from praying the emphatic and non-emphatic sunnah. If a person would like to attend the night prayer, that is permissible, duha prayer, that is permissible. The only two sunnahs that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was very keen to observe even while traveling, the two rakahs before Fajr and the witr prayer before going to sleep even while traveling. Before we begin the new chapter, I have a recommendation and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Muhammad from KSA assalamu alaikum welcome to the program Muhammad assalamu alaikum Kaisar how are you I'm doing fine alhamdulillah thank you for asking you. how about yourself uh, alhamdulillah say, alhamdulillah uh, it's uh, I just uh, seeing the screen saying that the Huda TV is in financial difficulty and uh, we are trying our level best to you know contribute uh, to Huda TV, inshallah. My, I have two questions saying, what is the target um, um, you are looking for to uh, settle the financial difficulty at the moment in Huda TV? And uh, my second question saying, uh, in the Surah Kahf, which is says the Dulkar name, uh, people used to say it is um, uh, Alexander Gray. Is that true, say? So that is the two questions I have. Okay. Barakallah feek. Thank, thank you, sir. Barakallah feek. Thank you, Muhammad, from the KSA. Uh, as far as your second question, there is no confirmation that he was Alexander the Great, but we know for sure that he was the only king who have ruled the East and the West, and he was a just ruler as the Almighty Allah described him in Surah Al-Kathr. With regards to your first question, any contribution, any sponsorship is really appreciated. Uh, to run and operate this channel annually, we're talking about uh, between 550 to 600,000, that's it, which is literally nothing. Because I do claim that everybody who is working on board is uh, contributing a great portion of their time for the sake of Allah, their effort, and their salaries. So we do our best to maintain airing the programs on this channel. May Allah the Almighty accept. And that's why the sponsorship for programs is still open. If any person is interested in sponsoring a program or an episode or a few episodes in any program, uh, we'll be more than happy, inshallah. You can leave your phone number with the control. You can take my uh, uh, number or you can send an SMS to the WhatsApp number that is um, on the bottom of the screen. The area code, the WhatsApp number, which will receive calls on. You can send a message in this regard. We'll be more than happy, inshallah, to get in touch with you. That is the number. Uh, on the bottom of the screen. Thank you, Brother Muhammad. Now with the recommendation that I wanted to share with the viewers, and not with all the viewers, particularly I'm talking about the employers, uh, the business owners, and uh, more specifically 
the sponsors or the Arabic term for it, the kafir, in the Gulf, where they have a lot of expats working for them from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Burma, and the Middle East, here or there. You know, many of you are very generous. You build masajid, schools, you contribute here and there, and your zakah is worth millions, mashallah. May Allah bless you. But also many of you are negligent of your duties towards your employees. Yep, that's right. You just heard the Prophet ﷺ say, فَإِذَا قَضَى أَحَدُكُمْ نَهْمَتَهُ مِنَ السَّفَرِ فَلْيُعَجِّلْ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ He ordered us not to stay away from our spouses, our wives, our children, our family for so long. Many of the expats, their income isn't good enough to make them sponsor their families, their wives to come and live with them. So the least we can do for them is allow them to travel twice a year. Why not? Trust me, Allah will make your business prosper. You will not lose. Your business will not suffer of any depression. Rather, on the contrary, if this is your intention. When you think that contributing towards building a masjid is more important than contributing towards building a human being or maintaining the love of a family, that is gravely wrong and mistaken. That's not true. The Prophet ﷺ said the sacredness of a believer is greater than the sacredness of the Kaaba itself. You know? So when you know that somebody is working for you, and here I'm not talking about only Muslims. If you have a non-Muslim working for you, why are you holding him and holding his passport and you do not allow him to visit his family and to go home for two and three and four years? Why? You know, if I am an employer and I have people working for me, I would pay for their round-trip tickets once or twice a year. I will be more than happy to do that. And this is an act of charity. You will be rewarded for that. Even if it is not included in the contract. He doesn't have to be an American citizen or a British citizen to be able to travel freely whenever he wants to. Any person, any human being maintains the same rights. So this is a brotherly and a friendly recommendation for those whom Allah blessed with wealth. And they happen to hire people, expats, from poor countries to work for them. You have a driver. How many years since he visited back home or met with his wife? Two years? That's haram. That's not permissible. Trust me. You know? You want to do something for the sake of Allah? If your wife is sick, if your son is giving you a hard time, do an act of charity by sending this person, this worker home and say, Here. I pay for your ticket. Go and visit your family. Stay for a couple of weeks. I just came back six months ago. Go again. Visit your family. No problem. This is what the Prophet ﷺ said, brothers and sisters. And we as Muslims should embody the advices, not just the commandments and the pillars of the deen, but all the advices of the Prophet ﷺ. None of you truly believe unless you love for others whatever you love for yourself. So imagine yourself being employed by somebody. What would you like? How much you miss your family? You know? May Allah make it easy for us, for all of us to comprehend his deen. Ameen. Aisya uh, Salim, even though the question is irrelevant, what exactly should we recite in the procession of forgetfulness? Do I have to recite anything in between? Whatever we recite in the regular prostrations, the speech three times, that would be sufficient. And whatever we recite in between the two prostrations, رَبِّ غْفِلِّي وَسَامِحْنِي وَهْدِنِي وَأَجِرْنِي وَعَافِنِي وَارْزُقَنِي Shamila Taimul is saying, I hope this is not a sin, because everything is coming from Allah, love, hate, trust, friendship. Um, maybe Allah is testing me. I think the question is missing uh, a segment. We'll look at it, inshallah, later on. And now with chapter number 176. The chapter with استحباب القدوم على أهله نهارا وكراهته في الليل لغير حادة. Every time we study a chapter in this beautiful collection of gardens of the pious, 
we realize that this is a beautiful religion. This is the most beautiful religion. It's full of etiquette, brothers and sisters. The desirability of returning home during the daytime and the dislikeness of coming to his family at the night time, especially the, part, the last part of the night without a person need. The first hadith we have is a very sound hadith. Let's learn the etiquette of returning home from the Prophet Sallallahu Jabir ibn Abdullah radiyallahu anhuma anna rasool Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam qal idha atala ahadukum al ghaybata fala yatruqanna ahlahu layla in another narration an yatruq al rajul ahlahu layla naha rasool Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam an yatruq al rajul ahlahu layla muttafaqun alayh so the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, whenever any of you stays away from his family for a long period of time, let him not surprise his family by night. In the other narration, he said that he forbade us from coming back to our family at night. Why? Or better, why not? What is wrong with returning at night? Well, the Prophet وسلم, explained in another sound hadith by the same narrator. He said, إِذَا قَادِمَ أَحَدُكُمْ لَيْلًا فَلَا يَأْتِيَنَّ أَهْلَهُ طُرُوقًا حَتَّى تَسْتَحِدَّ الْمُغِيبَةِ وَتَمْتَشِطَ الشَّعِثَةِ What does it mean? That is effective cause. He says, if you've been traveling for a long period of time, working in case A, working in Kuwait, working in... Uh, USA and you're returning home six months later, a year later. Some people think it's fun. It's so nice to surprise his wife and his kids. Hey, I'm here. He rings the bell. It's 2, 3 a.m. Who is this? Everybody is scared. That's daddy. That is not permissible. Rather, the Prophet Sallallahu <laughs> which means to return at the late part of the night without a previous notice, especially after a long journey. So from the hadith we understand, if somebody works the night shift and he normally returns 2 or 3 a.m., so his wife is used to that, no big deal. Come whenever you want to come. Somebody uh, was late at work and he said to his wife, I'll be coming kind of late, not a problem. He's talking about somebody who stayed for long five days, six days a week, month, two, six months, a year. So when you come, you shouldn't come at night. You shouldn't surprise them by dropping by at night, knocking on the door or trying to unlock the lock and enter in the house at night. Why not? What is the effective cause? Why is it not permissible? The Prophet ﷺ said for two reasons. حَتَّى تَسْتَحِدَّ الْمُغِيبَةِ what is the meaning of tastahid al mughiba A woman whose husband has been away for a while. Maybe she's kind of negligent of her taking care of herself, not wearing makeup, not combing her hair, not wearing nice cologne or perfume, you know, not taking care of the very personal hygiene. You know, it is a sunnah to shave the pubic area and to remove the underarm hair, to clip the nails, and all of that. This is from the deen. You know, it's not only for makeup. This is an essential part. The Prophet Sallallahu said, these are five essential prophetic traditions of the pure nature, of the pure instinct. Every human being should be doing that by nature. Then specifically Muslims should be very keen to take care of that. Men and women should remove the pubic hair and the underarm hair to clip their nails, so when a woman knows that her husband is away for a while, maybe she wasn't taking care of that. And تستحد المغيبة يعني to remove the pubic area, to shave, to clean up herself, to adorn herself so that she would look pretty for her husband, to put on a nice lingerie, nice perfume because your honey is coming back, your husband is returning. So when he returns, he sees what he likes. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, The word ash'ath, يعني with the shivel hair. We studied that when we said on the day of Arafah, Allah says, 
انظروا الى عبادي اتوني شعثا غبرا شعثا with the shovel hair and we said it is not recommended to comb your hair on the day of Arafah stay like that dusty and with the shovel hair but when a woman is anticipating the return of her husband she will wash her hair and take care of her hair and dress her hair and that is the meaning of tantashita ashaitha why because her husband is returning but when a person drops by all of a sudden and he sees his wife maybe in what is known as thiyabul mihna she's been cleaning up the house and taking care of the kids and she was so tired so she dropped asleep so he comes home and you smell you stink look at this you, you're not even taking taking care of yourself yes but yes i didn't know that you're coming no if you give me a buzz i would have taken care of myself that was again 1400 years ago because they didn't have any means of communication. They didn't have WhatsApp. They didn't have social media. They didn't have, uh, you know, cell phones. They didn't have messages or messengers. But now, if a person is returning at any time and he just lets his family know that, I will be arriving, my flight would land at 2 a.m. I should be home by 4 a.m. So they are alert, they are awake, they are anxiously waiting for him. Is there any prohibition against that? Nope. So I don't have to stay at the airport or sleep on the floor or uh, hire a hotel room until the morning? No, nope. because the effective cause, the effective cause is to make your wife get ready and to be prepared for you. The kid likewise. You know, we have guests and the house is upside down. But now I knew that you're coming, so I take care of that. The Prophet ﷺ had it. Uh, let's take this call first. Assalamu alaikum. Muhammad from Germany. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum, Muhammad. Muhammad, can you hear me? Assalamu alaikum, Chair. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the program. I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Go ahead if you have any questions, please. Yeah, Chair, my, my question is, uh, and, um, is it allowed to read the following dua in, uh, when, when, you, when I'm making sajda like... Uh, اللهم إنا نسألك من خير ما سألك من نبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونبيك من شرف السعادة من نبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وأنت المستعان وعليك البلاء ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. أجاد الدعاء. Yes. When you wanna recite it. Okay. I got your question, Muhammad from Germany. Because I had it so that up to ten salawat in such a position. Got your question. بارك الله فيك. No, it is definitely permissible to recite this supplication and any other supplication, including sending the peace and the blessings upon Prophet Muhammad in your persuasion. There is no problem with that whatsoever. As a matter of fact, it is in the contrary. There is a recommendation by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to increase making supplications while in persuasion. Barakallah feek. So, uh, the two effective cause, حَتَّى تَسْتَحِدَّ الْمُغِيبَةِ Okay. Is why the Prophet said, إذا أطال أحدكم الغيبة فلا يطرقن أهله ليلا. Whenever any of you has been traveling and stays away from his family for a while, he should not come to his family at night. But the Prophet used to come during the day and during the evening, evening till sunset, till Isha is fine. But after that, that was in the past. If the family now know that you're coming, there is no problem whatsoever. The Prophet وسلم, whenever he would return from an expedition, from a caravan or a journey, number one, if it was daytime, he would head to the masjid immediately, pray two rakahs, then he goes home. And similarly, his companions, that is the sunnah. Uh, if he was at night, he will camp on the borders of Medina so that people will get notified that the Prophet and his companions have returned. So every wife would prepare herself for her husband and the kids too will prepare themselves for the return of their father and so on. Nowadays, because we have an access and that tells us that whether day or night, it is best to keep communications to tell your wife that, hey, I have a friend who's coming home with me. What do we have for lunch? I'm so tired. I started my MS and I cannot talk. Oh, that's okay. We'll go out. We'll, we'll dine outside. So there must be communication, brothers and sisters. The meaning of a family father does not mean that a person is a dictator or he has the only say. No. 
وأمرهم شورى بينهم so they consult each other in every matter in every affair well the house is not ready obviously whenever both of them are on the same page and that happens occasionally and the wife should not show resentment every time he's bringing somebody no 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 because that becomes problematic that's a different matter inshallah which we'll tackle in uh, another time but we're in our time for today's episode until next time brothers and sisters i'll leave you all in the care of allah aqulu qawli hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Rasulallah, Habiballah Allah, our God is the greatest The one and only glory to Him He born in humans to be the best And give His best religion to them Allah, our God is the greatest The one and only glory to Him He born in humans to be the best and give his best religion to them. So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about it in paradise. Worshipping cows, fire and stones. Selling the best with the cheapest price. So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise. Worshipping cows, fire and stones. Selling their best with the cheapest price. Rasulullah, Habibullah.